I could tell you all about my life, but it might be better if you tell me what you want to hear because some of you have heard me talk before and some of you haven't. So um, somebody kick me off with a question and we'll get it going from there. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, your character on Space 1999, what, what was your favorite part of that character and what were your not so favorite parts? You know, I didn't have any non-favorite parts about what I was doing with the show. I loved being on the show. Um, as a young actor, when you break into the industry, wherever you might be, one of the kind of dreams would be eventually, when I was young, to become a cowboy, you know, be a cowboy actor. Uh, and then later on, it might have been to do like a war movie or something, you know. Some, um, for me at least, I wanted to do macho roles because that was my kind of thing in life. I loved surfing and uh, I was in the army at a young stage of my life. I, I actually had a green beret, which is to me the proudest thing that I ever did in my life because it was it was really hard, you know. There was 86 men in my intake. I, you know, it's it's, it's kind of like getting into the Olympic program. There were 86 men in the intake and only 18 of us got green berries in the end, you know. Uh, uh, they decided we should do singles. You're going to do another single after me. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't tell you. I know nothing. <laughs> We're all going to sign autographs in between that too, as well. Um, so uh, yeah, that was. My dad left. Uh, my mum and dad split up and uh, it was tough, you know, we've all got stories to tell. But I just wanted to find my old man and sort him out, you know. So I, I looked for ways to, I was like 14 when he finally left the house and it wasn't a happy time. Uh, so I wanted to, and I, there was a guy up the road from me who was a, captain of the Warrywood Surf Club and he took me under his wing and uh, I used to go surfing with him every day and he really did a job on me. I, he had two sons that were older than I was and they wouldn't come near him and I couldn't understand why. He had me pushing weights, bench pressing 250 pounds when I was 16 years of age, you know, and he'd bring, if his sons ever visit him, and at that stage, I was thinking, this is great, I'm loving doing this, Dana. And he'd bring in, Derek would say, Derek, come and look at what Nick's doing. And Derek would come and stand at the door with his arms full of you. Yeah, yeah, walk away again. And I thought, what's that all about? I, when I finally, the penny dropped, he was, he pushed his sons to the extent that they didn't want to know about any of this. They didn't want to be as macho as their dad. He was amateur New South Wales heavyweight wrestling champion for seven years in a row. He was one hell of a tough guy. His neck started underneath his ears and finished on his shoulders. And in amateur wrestling, you don't have the three count. You just have to be pushed down and, and make a proper touch. Full shoulders flat under that. That's it. You, know, that's, you only get that. Uh, and, and they couldn't push him down because he'd go down and boom, he'd bridge up from his head through to his ass. His back was like, you couldn't, you could stand on him, a 300, man, 300 pound man could stand on him, you couldn't push him down. So, I mean, I never did that, but he, he really got me going. And, because I could go home at night, I didn't have him constantly telling me what I should do. He was just pleased that somebody would finally listen to him and, and want to be taught by him, you know. So, I used that, and then I got into the army when I left school. And as I said, you know, eventually wound up with a green berry. So when I went to England in 1965, my father had been gone from home for over seven years. I hadn't seen him. And the last time I'd seen him, we'd had a pretty difficult time. And so I just wanted him to give me one reason to sort him out, you know. And I, and I get off the, the, the ship in Tilbury Docks, and you can't see there's such a fog. And there's huge seagulls great big giant things coming out of the fog and sitting on the handrail. And I'm trying to look at England for the first time in my life. I'm 23 years of age. And all I can see is fog and I can hear, oh, you know, the boat noises and stuff. And this is England. And eventually I went down the gangplank expecting to see this big man, because he was six feet tall. 
But I hadn't seen him in the next seven years. And he had shrunk and I had grown. And so I, what I saw was kind of like Santa Claus. He had a huge red beard that was flecked with white, kind of like your beard. And he was huge. He went, Nicky, he came over to me. I tried to put my arms around him. Not, you know, I didn't know about this guy. I couldn't get my arms around him. And he said, let's go and have a beer. And I said, oh no, I'll never drink with you. Because my dad was an alcoholic. But he wasn't a fall down, although he did fall down. He, he was just a man that drank so much all the time. That was his life. And that's all I remember about him, just coming home and tearing up the place, you know. So I made it very clear to him right there and then that that, that wasn't going to be my lifestyle. And especially with him, you know. Uh, I learned to love him, and I never had loved him before, you know, because he wasn't at home battling my mother, or she battling him. He was what I consider to be a fairly lost soul, you know. Um, uh, I watched a movie yesterday on the airplane, and I wept like a child all the way in the plane. I watched Rocket Man, and I identified with him so much. I'm not gay, but that's, that's not a good or a bad thing. I just identified with that life of having a father that didn't give a shit, didn't understand, you know? Uh, fortunately, I had a mother that loved me. I mean, has anybody seen the movie Rocket Man here? Yeah. I, I, just, I just think that boy, Taron, has got to win the Oscar for that performance. And the director's got to win the director's Award. It was the most gut-wrenching, most beautiful, clever film. Anyway, um, and, it, and I didn't realize how I could be affected like that. And that's why I'm telling you about my dad and stuff. I wouldn't know, normally talk about that. It's too emotional. But I realized that it, that it made a big impact on me. And I never, ever, I never laid a finger on my son or my daughter, ever. Uh, I've never wanted to, never needed to. I just had the best relationship with both of them. And I loved them greatly. And that was all because I just didn't want to be like that. You know? Uh, and uh, man, did he show it in Rocket Man. It's just a staggering performance. Um, I even fe forget you damn quick. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> I really shouldn't be talking like this. But I, I, I wanted Alan Carter to be the opposite of what my dad was, you know? Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. And uh, he was kind of like an altruistic character of somewhat similar to myself. I'm, you know, I'm not a hero, I'm just an ordinary actor. And, and that's why this thing of loyalty, you know, about the, the love, people, and I know that you, you loved Space 1999 and a lot of you loved Alan Carter. I would have loved that guy too, because he was, you know, hey, let's go and save the world, you know? Uh, and I was thrilled that the writers wanted to go down that path. And the more I did it, the more they wanted it, which was, you know, just so, so rewarding. And then to have people come to me 42 years later and say, I mean, I've had people come in and say, I became a policeman because of you, or I became an army sergeant, or I became a school teacher. All these things about how they wanted to, they were buoyed up by the, uh, the altruism of that character, which was the exact opposite of what my childhood was about, because I wanted, I wanted that too. And there was a chance to be able to show that. So it was a gift of a role, an absolute gift of a role to me. Uh, and um, sometimes I, I, I was not allowed to demonstrate all that I could in that show because there were other actors to think of and other characters to, to portray in the, in, in the piece. And it wasn't about one character. But I was lucky that there was enough of Alan Carter to, to make the right kind of impact. Uh, it, sometimes in, in an actor's life, you're given those opportunities and more often than not, you're not. Um, and I didn't realize when I was doing it and even I, after I finished it, that it would have this kind of effect. 40 years later, you know, that people would still love that show. Uh, in fact, I think it's extraordinary. It, it, it's unprecedented for me that anything else I've ever done in my life, that 40 years later, people have got such a memory of it and 
a far greater understanding of it than I have because I don't watch the shows. I, I did sit and watch the Blu-ray that I mentioned earlier on because somebody else had said to me, I love that show, I want to watch it. And my daughter's going, no, Dad, you don't want to get old rubbish, you know. And, and you do, and you look at it and go, wow. And, but I'm looking at the whole thing, you know. Can't remember a lot of it. Um, go on, yes. Well, there are, there are a lot of people who don't have role models in their, in their real lives. So mm. to see characters like uh, Alan Carter is a good role model on television. It's, it's, it's a nice opportunity for people. Well, clearly, uh, th yeah, that's that's what's appealed. And there are shows today, exactly, where there are characters that do that. You know, I mean, th this is a totally different kind of a role model. But uh, Ray Donovan, the television series, you know, I just, I, I never, I never liked Lee Erickson before. I mean, I I knew he was a good actor, and he was doing stuff that I didn't really care about. And then I watched Ray Donovan, and, and I thought, man, what a performance! That's for me, the best thing on television. Uh, just personally me, you know, I know there's all, to, all sorts of other things that you can do. I mean, I love, um, I told you I loved Breaking Bad. I thought that was fabulous. There's no characters in Breaking Bad I'd ever want to be, but I just love the brilliance of the show. Nor would I want to be any of the characters in Downton Abbey. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sure that I could, you know, if I was offered, I could play some of them. But but it just shows you how diverse in, in, in our entertainment world our choices can be, because I love both of those shows hugely. As I said, to me, Downton Abbey was the best television coming out of Britain, and uh, Breaking Bad was the best coming out of America. It's not to say that there aren't other great shows. In some, there's so much happening in, in American television now with the advent of, uh, of the HBOs and uh, the Netflix making their own material, you know, and wonderful opportunities happening. <coughs> For the, for the entertainment industry. Can we have another question? Man over there, sir? A big part of your character obviously was me. No, no, sorry, the guy in the back stood up oh, first. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, so straight line. Let him finish. Let him finish. Okay. Yeah, okay. Let you, him finish now. One, two. You come Mine first. Aside. Come on. A big part of your character was being a you know, top gun pilot in space. Just curious, later, did any of that follow with you in your personal life? In Absolutely not. <laughs> Had enough of it on the show. Yeah, you know, I don't jump off, well, I have jumped off cliffs before, but no, I, I want to live, man. You know, I, I've got a friend of mine that goes hang gliding, you know, and oh, I, I do have a hang gliding story. I wanted to go hang gliding too, uh, well before Space 1999, and my father had moved uh, to the Isle of Wight with his family, and you know, I have half brothers and sisters. And in the Isle of Wight uh, in England, uh, there's some wonderful hills that come off of the ocean. So there's a great updraft in a place called Afton Bank. Uh, Compton Farm is a place that's there. The funny thing about Compton Farm is that my wife, as a tiny child, her father discovered Compton Farm. And there's an outhouse that you can rent to stay in that outhouse. And they used to go there every summer. My father lived, my father's family lived about 500 yards from Compton Farm. And so I used to come down to the Isle of Wight and spend summers with my father after the incident with the, the fog and everything. I lived in England for many, many years. And I saw lots of my father, and that's when I learned to love him. Um, and I didn't know any of the visitors that ever went to Compton Farm that literally was down the road to Freshwater Beach. And I would pass families all the time. I must have walked past this little girl. I'm 11 years older than my wife. So when I was in England at the age of 23, she would have been 11. And I would see this little girl walking to the beach, and I might have even laid down on the sand next to the family. I never knew that I was anywhere near my wife until I met her in 1975, the 28th of November at 8.30 at night. God, you remember that stuff? <laughs> She said, people said to me, how do you remember? I said, well, if you got hit by a truck that nearly crippled you for life, you'd remember. <laughs> I love my wife. I seriously do. She's fabulous. 42 years, you know. She's the best human being I know.
they have to be to put, uh, seriously, you'd have to be to put up with an egomaniac like me. She's, she's wonderful. I just was talking to her on the phone. She said, are you talking about your favorite subject? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah she, knows, she, knows, she knows me, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I've messed up on the question again. I digress so much in life, it's ridiculous. What did you ask me? Oh, uh if you would take that. No, I'm not brave enough to do that because, oh, so the Compton, yeah, okay, the, the people hang gliding off Compton Farm, right? But you can't glide. Hang, hang gliding. Now, I had done an episode of Holiday Island, which was a television series I did in Australia, and I had to hang glide in that, but they cheated. What they did was um, they hung the hang glider up and they moved it on a low loader and I'm in it and they're shooting from underneath, so it looks like I'm hang gliding, right? I did have to land, which meant that I could run down a, a slope and, and the hang glider just kind of, just as it was starting to lift off, I landed and ran. <coughs> so that put the water looked like I'd been flying. But it gave me the flavor and so I wanted to do it. And I went to, to, to my father's house on the island, this guy hang gliding. And people said, oh, you can go hang glide. So I walked up onto the farm and went up to where he was. There were several people taking off and I said, do you teach? And he said, yeah, I do, you know. And I said, well, I, I'd like to do this. So he said, well, I'm pretty booked up today. Could you come tomorrow morning? And I went, well, if I stick around, can I do it today? And he said, well, we'll see. So I stuck around till literally six or seven o'clock at night. And in the end, he said, no, we can't do this now. You'll have to come back in the morning. They have put huge high wires through his property. So there's this, you can hear it, and then big wires. And when you land, you have to be real careful. You don't go anywhere near those wires. So that was a worry. I was thinking, I wonder how you get past those wires, you know. <laughs> anyway, so he said, come back in the morning and we'll, we'll kick it off. So I went home that night. It was August uh, the 8th, 1975. And um, I spent the night in my father's house. He lived in an old house like Wuthering Heights. It was a really old mansion house that belonged to his wife's family. Big gravel drive and farms all around and cows everywhere. It was a very rural rural area, Freshwater Bay. And uh, the phone rang at about two o'clock in the morning. And they've got this house echoes. And I was sleeping in like one of the wings upstairs. There's 12 bedrooms in this place. And down in the kitchen, there's all these little one, two, three, four, five numbers, 12 numbers and people would pull on a thing. This is like Downton Abbey. That's the place he was living in, right? And he'd go ding, 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 and they'd, they'd bring up a hot water bottle or a cup of hot chocolate or whatever it was in those days. So this was a weird house, and the wind would blow, and the trees would <laughs> against your window. Oh, Jesus Christ. It was a very scary place, you know? And I'm sleeping upstairs, and they're downstairs, and they've got a grandfather clock every hour that would go, bong, bong, bong. Bung, three o'clock, and then bung, 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 four. I, I heard every chime all night long. I don't know how my, my, my family lived there, so I knew that it was two o'clock in the morning. It had just gone off, and the phone is ringing, and nobody's answering the phone. I thought, why would somebody be ringing my father at two o'clock in the morning? So I got up, and I went downstairs, and I answered this phone, and it was my ex-girlfriend. She rang me, and she said, Nikki, I've got some bad news. I went, What's going on? She said, your mother just died. I, I, I adored my mother. She was the real actor in my family. She was a wonderful actress. She, she'd been on the West End of England. She made movies in England. She went back to Australia just before the Second World War because she married a man who was a very wealthy grazier and he wanted to come home and and not be in Europe when the war was going, taking place. So she got one of the last ships you could get on to get out of England in 1939, um, when the winds of war were very strongly blowing in England. And um, she wound up coming to this man and being taken out to his sheep station. And she suddenly thought she'd come from the West End of London, where she was a starring actress, to suddenly be the only people she could talk to were sheep shearers <laughs> and, and um, Australian cowboys. And she thought, what have I done? She was married to this man for one week. So she left him and came into Sydney and then, well, well now I've come back for him and 
I can't go back to England. So she was offered a play in Sydney and her career took off in Australia. And she met my father and I was born in 1942 in the middle of the war. So <clears throat> this wonderful woman who was star of stage and screen in Australia for so many years uh, and was my hero and because uh, my dad was no good to me, um, then became good for me later. Uh, so this woman who was in my life, and, uh, and uh, this is kind of weird because it was between the episodes of Space 1999. I'd done the first season of Space 1999, and we finished in March, and I flew home instantly to, to be in a, a, a Fred Skepsis film, The Devil's Playground which if any of you know my career, was really the breakthrough film for me. I won the AFI award in Australia for it. And um, whilst I was doing it, um, uh, Jerry Anderson um, called me up and said, I need you to come back and star in a pilot for a television series I'm doing. I didn't think Jerry liked me. And I told you, he told me I don't like actors. And here he's offering me the lead in a new television series. Space 1999 was not gonna happen. Right? It was over. We were finished. And he's offering me the lead in a series that he said he'd sold to the BBC already. This was the pilot episode. He wanted me, he wanted Brian Blessed, Joanna Dunham, and, um, and some kids. Uh, and I, some of you may know the show. It's called Into Infinity or The Day After Tomorrow. It was the pilot for what was to be an investigative television series about the possibilities of entering, going into space. And it was done very, very cheaply. He revamped some of the old sets of Space 1999. And uh, well, I came back and I shot it in two weeks. And um, just before I came back, I finished shooting The Devil's Playground in Melbourne on an island called the uh, um, Phillip Island, which was a tiny little area. And I flew back to Sydney for four days with my mother before I came back to England. And um, when I was leaving, the taxi arrived and tooted his horn, and I said, you going to come down? She said, no, this is goodbye, darling. I said, well, come down, because she wouldn't come to the airport. And I said, well, come down. No, no, she wouldn't come. She said, it's goodbye. I said, don't be dramatic. It's not goodbye. It's just hasta la vista. I'll be back maybe another six months' time. And she said, no, this is goodbye. Very dramatic. I'm like, oh, you're just being silly. I didn't know she was going to be dead in 14 days' time. I came back to England, I shot the pilot in 14 days, I didn't telephone her like I said I would, and then I went down to the Isle of Wight to see my dad after I'd finished. I was going to hang glide that night, my mother died in the night. Save me from hang gliding. I know that she died for me. You're not going to hang glide, I'm going to stop you. I was on the ferry out of the Isle of Wight at 6 o'clock in the morning, I was on a plane back to Australia by midday went home and um, did all the things you do at a funeral, um, which was not easy. And uh, I remember my mother saying to me before I left Australia, when are you going to give me grandchildren? When are you going to marry some lovely girl? You know? I remember getting down on my hands and knees in the house of Australia where my mother had died and saying to God, will you please send me a sane, nice, un-egotistical human being to be my wife. I played around a lot and all the actresses I played around didn't deserve me and I didn't deserve them. Um, I just couldn't seem to settle down and uh, it took the death of my mother to do it for me and my asking God to send me a plane, not plane but just a straight girl that wasn't always looking in the mirror and wanting to be a star actress because it's, you know, God bless my mother, she was gorgeous and she was a star actress and my father couldn't handle it and I didn't want that to happen to me, uh, you know, because I started to understand my father and know why he couldn't handle life because she was dynamic, my mother. And um, I know I've digressed a lot here, but it's funny because it all happened all between the two Space 1999s. And I did that pilot for the series, uh, which the BBC wanted to do, and Jerry would have done had he not got a call from ITC saying, we want to go with the second series of Space, Space 1999. And uh, I remember going to a party somewhere, because uh, a friend of mine had said, um, 
oh, my, my, my cousin keeps on saying she's got all these girls living over there in Kensington. You've got to come and you know, meet some girls. I, I don't want to go to your party. And uh, I had a party of my own on one night and uh, everybody got very drunk. And uh, I think I got up about midday and I'm trying to clean up the property. And at about seven o'clock at night, there's a ring on my doorbell and he's there and he's saying, come on, we're going over to my cousin's house. You're going to meet these girls. And I went, no, man, I don't want to do that. That's not me. He said, it is you. And I said, well, it might have been one. No, I, I, I remembered being on my hands and knees and said, you know, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to be a good guy. You know, let's do this right. So I went out of shower and shaved and he waited for me and I went to the party and it was just full of all the sort of people I didn't want to be with. So after spending about 25 minutes in the party, I left. I walked down the steps and a girl was coming in and she said to me, are you leaving? And I went, um, no, I'm just getting something out of my car. <laughs> <laughs> and I married her. I had no idea that it would be 42 years of pretty damn good marriage. Yeah. She was all those things. Sweet, kind, great mother. I hope you're all as lucky. Um, and then, the second series of Space 1999 started. I think most of you know that we were all fired. None of us were asked back. I couldn't understand why we weren't asked back. Jerry had asked me to come and do the pilot. He must love me. I said to my agent, I hear Space 1999 is going ahead again. She said, yes, Nick, but not with you. I said, I can't believe that. I, I'm the only one out of the cast that goes to all the Space 1999 conventions. <laughs> I know people like me. Are they crazy? I asked if I could meet Jerry. He wouldn't meet me. Couldn't talk to Sylvia. He divorced her. One of the reasons is because Sylvia liked me a lot. She liked all of us a lot. And Jerry went, I'm not having any of those people. And Freddie Freiberger and his ear about it, right? Didn't want to have us. So the show starts uh, in January of 2000, I'm sorry, 1976. And I get a phone call on Friday. The show's due to start on Monday. I get a phone call on Friday from my agent saying, Jerry Anderson wants to see you. I thought, what for? Why does Jerry Anderson want to see me? She said, I think you should go and see him. So I went down and I saw him. And this is huge activity going on. The series is about to start, right? Uh, and I see people walking around in all the outfits, slightly different with colored collars on and stuff. And they go, this is really happening without me. I can't believe they're doing this. What does Jerry want to see me for? So I walk into his office, he closes the door and he says, well, Nick, you've won. <laughs> so what you, what, I've won, what have I won? I said, we want you back in the show. I said, what, the show that you're starting on Monday? And he said, yes. I said, how many scripts do you have? He said, seven. I said, how many scripts is Alan Carter in? He said, well, we're just, you know. I said, what, cross out pilot and write in Alan Carter? <laughs> I mean, I was really fucking pissed. I said, thanks, but no thanks, Jerry. He said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, what are you talking about? What, uh, Fred Freiberger wants to meet you. I said, who? He said, he's the new producer. And I said, oh yeah. Well, the guy that fired everybody, Jerry. I said, I, I don't know what you're doing. This is extra, I was really, I should have been going, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> but I knew something was afoot. Something was very wrong. So anyway, I met Mr. Freiberger. I did not like him from the minute I laid eyes on him. He told me that he thought that all the characters in Space 1999, apart from Martin and Barbara, were wooden, and he wanted to make them human. 
And they said, so you thought Alan Carter was wooden? And he said, well, I'm sorry, Nick. Yeah, you know, maybe it was a writing, I don't know. But he said, if you work for me, I'm going to give you meaningful lines. <laughs> oh, yeah. And he said, and he said, I'm going to promote you. You're going to be a lieutenant. <laughs> and I said, have you seen this series? <laughs> I said, of course I've not. Look, I've sat through all of them. And you thought I was, what did you think I was? He said, you were the, the, the pilot, the, the pilot guy. I said, yeah. And you thought you're going to promote me to lieutenant? He said, yeah. I said, I was a captain. <laughs> you're going to demote me. I swear to God, I mean, I, this man was unbelievable. Sorry, we would have maybe had five seasons if it weren't for him. But who knows? Anyway, I, I don't want to be too negative. That's about as negative as I hope I will be. Somebody give me a bright question. Yes, sir. Any practical jokers on the set? Practical jokers. Catherine was a bit naughty. I loved Catherine. <laughs> she was great. Uh, when we were doing the first series, the first series of Space 1999 with Prentice and Xenia and Anton and Clifton, uh, it, it, it was more like science faction than science fiction, you know. It was based on what people knew back in 1975 to be the possibilities of, of, of future science. And um, they wanted the show to have a, a real sense of, of exploration and truth about it. And uh, we didn't want the pantomime um, devils and weirdos and things that Freddie Freiberger wanted in the second series. And so um, it would have been hard for a lot of those actors to come back because we were doing a different kind of television series, the first show. But then, you know, uh, ITC wanted it to be more fanciful. And Fred Freiger, Freiberger, to his uh, credit, talked them into the fact that he could do that. And I think some of the episodes of the second, although most people say, the people that love the series love the first series better. Uh, there were some very good episodes in the second series. But when, when Fred offered me the role, instead of saying uh, that I would sign for the entire series, I said, uh, I'm, I don't want to sign for all of the episodes. I will do them episode by episode. Because he said, I'm going to write meaningfully, meaningfully for you. Right? You'll see. I said, well, then. I will just accept each episode as they come along. He said, why? I mean, I need to know how to write for you. I said, you keep writing for me well, I'll stay. If you don't write for me well, I'm out of here. And um, that was the one thing I had over him. So um, we did, I think, about four episodes. And then when the fifth episode was written, I had one line saying, uh, um, it was a the Commander Koenig called out to Alan Carter, and I was on a moon buggy. And they had a shot of the moon buggy, because I've seen the episode. This tiny little figure on the moon buggy saying, yes, we'll do, Commander. I think that's something like that line, you know. Yes, we'll do, Commander. And I took the script, and I walked into his office, and I said, is this how you write meaningfully for me? And he said, oh, for God's sake, Nick, it can't be. And I said, you can stick it up your ass. And I walked out. I walked out, I went home to my, as that then not my wife, girlfriend, Hazel, and I picked up the newspaper and the London Times, and they used to have on the back page of the London Times all the holidays you could take. And there was a holiday to Marhofen, skiing, all found, and I loved skiing. I said, do you ski? She said, no. I said, would you like to? She said, yes, when? And I said, tomorrow, we're going tomorrow. <laughs> and I left. I, and I didn't tell my agent, I didn't tell anybody, I vanished from London. I was gone for two weeks, and I think they probably had the right to sue me for hundreds of thousands of dollars for having walked out on the show. But I, I did tell Fred Freiberger that if he didn't write for me, I was out. And he didn't write for me, so I was out. And when I came back, he practically went down on his knees to me, saying, you know, I promise. And he did write well for me after that. He did ask people to write for me, you know. Um, however, there were a couple of episodes that things weren't 
quite what I wanted, and I said, I'm walking. You'll be back next episode, and I'm, yeah, maybe, you know. But then in the end, we got to that point when there were, he was running out of time, and we did eight episodes back to back. So there were basically four episodes happening at the same time. We used two different sets, L stage and M stage, and um, Barbara was mostly in that four, and Martin was mostly in that four, and they would cross over and make sure that Martin and Barbara were in all eight of them. And Tony Ann Holt was in four of them, and I was in four of them, and that's the way they did that at the very end. And we picked up a month and a half of time on the show, because we shot it all in less than a year, 11 months we shot the second series, where we'd taken 18 months to shoot the first series. Um, but I think those eight episodes suffered for that because they were shot very quickly and they were shot without any other regard other than that he had to fulfill the commitment of 24 episodes. Next question. So, uh, Were there any, uh, any scenes or episodes that you especially enjoyed as an actor or any that you especially did not enjoy as an actor in that space? Uh, I, I, I think I said earlier, I, there was never anything that I didn't enjoy other than telling Fred Freiberger he could stick it up his ass. <laughs> but then again, I really enjoyed that too. <laughs> I remember saying to him, I remember, I remember saying to him, you American, because in, in England we didn't really like Americans very much, sorry. Uh, and particularly people that uh, were involved with the film industry that kept on coming to England and saying we were doing it all the wrong way and people like Fred said he was going to show us how to do it, you know, he knew how to do it. And I said, you, American, speak with fork tongue. <laughs> I thought that was clever. <laughs> but I'm not a writer. Uh, now, things that I enjoyed, I loved doing the episode where we shot a lot of it outside on the lot, um, where we go back to Bannockburn. And I, and I had to fight those people with bits of wood while they've got swords and stuff. That was good fun. Uh, that was a, uh, half of it was shot off out of the studio and we never did that. Um, I liked in the first series uh, where we had the doppelganger thing happened and uh, Judy Jason was in it and she goes berserk because her Ellen Carter and, and her world dies. And then when I come back, she suddenly freaks out that I'm a dead man walking, you know. Uh, and, but Prentice and Xenia and Barry Moss all go down to the, the new earth that they're trying to start. And, uh, and then we meet them. And it's weird because everybody's, there's two, two of us. My Alan Carter was dead, the, my counterpart on that, on that planet. Uh, that was a very clever episode. Uh, I just can't remember them all so well. Uh, I get things wrong because I don't get to watch the show to remind myself that much. But um, yeah, I had some 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 great fun, and I worked with some absolutely wonderful performers. Such a great thrill to be, you know, with Peter Cushing, and um, uh, I said earlier on. Uh, Leo McCurran, these were giants of the British industry, and giants of the film world in general. People like Joan Collins, who I had lusted after for years. <laughs> there she was, and saying to me, what are you doing for lunch tomorrow? I said, nothing. <laughs> so she said, let's go to the commissary together. So I said, okay, okay. I mean, I, I wanted to ask her out to lunch, but I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna make that move. <laughs> And uh, so I went to lunch with her and she brought her children. <laughs> now, people might not know this about Joan Collins. Do you, you know who I'm talking about, don't you? She was just the most beautiful and exciting female. She had a little um, Down syndrome boy. I did not know that. And I sat next to him at lunch and she was, and I, I enjoyed him great because he was a lovely kid. And she was so gentle and wonderful with him. And I thought, I wish people knew this Joan Collins, you know, because I don't think people know that about her. I, 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 I've had got, got similar experiences all the way through the show. I just can't remember them right now specifically, but 
I got to be, well, we talked about Ian McShane. I became great friends with Ian McShane just in the, in the two weeks he was there because there was a lot of, we have a lot of similarities and we played a lot of competitive backgammon. That's the stuff that we used to do when we weren't on set. We were in the studio, so we didn't leave the studio, but we'd be around the back of the set somewhere moving the backgammon. We had to use the felt boards rather than the wooden boards, so everything was quiet. And sometimes you'd go, hey! <laughs> and trying to roll the dice quietly, you know. Now, a lot of stuff went on behind the scenes. That's why people like Susan, who wasn't ever on camera, although she actually did do a scene on camera, but generally speaking, she wasn't on camera. But we spent a lot of time off camera together whilst other people were working, sitting in corners, talking to each other. I was in the show for three years, you know. You, you make a lot of friends in that time. It was a great part of my life. Enjoyed it immensely. The question? Yes, yes, yes. Finally. <laughs> Thanks. So in 2017, you were tremendously kind and recorded a um, radio promotion for my radio show back on Long Island. So now, yes, you did. <laughs> and yes. And so I put it together and put some sound effects. I'm doing my show, I have a couple of ladies in the studio with me who are promoting a Doctor Who book, and you know, the music's playing and we're getting ready to go live, and I play your promo, and they melt it. <laughs> they heard your voice. <laughs> so, my question is, I know you've been married for 42 years and everything, but, I mean, ladies love Alan Carter. How, how is that? going through life with that <laughs> back then. I, I, I don't know if I can swear, but I have sworn already, so I can say it again. Other women have said to my wife, are you, are you worried about Nick? And, they, and she says, what do you mean? She said, well, you know, he was very physically sexual as Ellen Carter, and a lot of women like that. And she said, well, him? He doesn't have a spare fuck in him. <laughs> That's why I love my wife. She's so, she says what she means. Yes? Uh, quick question. Um, it's been great seeing you turn up in uh, like Star Trek and a few other places. Yeah. Any chance we could ever see you in something like The Expanse? Are you familiar with that? It's like one of the... Something like the what? The Expanse. It's uh, one of the more recent, extremely well-made science fiction shows. I'd love to put a bug in their ear to get you on there. Well, I'd love you to, too. Um, <laughs> quite frankly, I, I basically, I haven't retired, but I, when people ask me, I said, I, I haven't retired, but I think my manager thinks I have. <laughs> Look, I shot myself in the foot, guys. I really did. Uh, when I finished Space 1999, I was asked to come and work in America, but I had met Hansel. So I stayed in England and married Hazel. And my career, I then bought a, a broken down old house in, in Wandsworth and I tore it to pieces and I rebuilt it by myself, right? Sometimes I'd ask a carpenter or a plumber to come in, but I love building. I have bought and sold, not I haven't sold two of them, I bought and sold five other houses, I bought and sold seven houses. And I tear them apart and I rebuild them. It's just my passion in life. I love, that's why I fell off the roof. You know, I, I don't know if you, uh, you were here yesterday, I talked about falling off the roof. I was up there, you know, cleaning out the gutters. Why? Because I like doing things like that, you know. It's not like I'm not being a hero or anything, I just am stupid. And uh, I do a lot of building, I've been electrocuted, I've uh, chopped pieces off my fingers and I've done all sorts of weird things, hit myself with hammers so many times I can't tell you. I, I just like building. Um, so, uh, in the middle of my career, when I might have been able to capitalize on the real kudos of Space 1999, instead I bought an old derelict house in Wandsworth and I spent the next two years working on it, so I never went to any auditions. I spent all the money I made out of Space 1999 turning this little old house into a beautiful house that went on home and garden. My wife is very creative, so she dresses everything. I build it. I do the structural stuff. She does all the coloring and the curtains and the cushions and 
great at it, you know. And we've done that with every house we've ever had. Um, they always get into magazines and stuff because of her, right? Uh, and um, my career as an actor has suffered. In the meantime, I might have gone to a party somewhere, as I did when I came back to America, and some guy says to me, uh, you know, you, you got a great voice. And I said, you got a pretty good voice, too. And he said, no, man, fuck that. He said, man, he said, you could do movie trailers with a voice like that. And I said, well, yeah, you know, but it's hard to get in. He said, I can get you in. And I said, how? He said, I make movie trailers. <laughs> so I said, oh, okay. Uh, I didn't. He gave me a card. I never called him. About five weeks later, the phone rings. I go, oh, and he says, are you working? I said, excuse me, who's this? You know who it is. I asked you, are you working? And I said, uh, no. He said, what, don't you like money? And I said, yeah, I actually do like money. He says, well, come on over, I'll give you some. So I went over to his house, and he lived in a house overlooking the hill down into Universal Studios. And he had this funny little old house, and half his house was studio equipment, a lot of old equipment. And he used to make movie trailers for not necessarily um, second string films, but on his own, it was. And it used Don LaFontaine many a time, and Don LaFontaine was the great voice of American voice service. He was the god of voice service. Like, in a world, that's gone, you know? <laughs> Although I've used it quite a bit myself. Uh, but we don't write the stuff, other people write it, you know? And he was right, he had a lot of Don's old um, movie trailers that he'd worked on with him. He took his voice off and he got me to, because he said, I'm going to get you an agent. I said, oh, good luck. Because they have special voiceover agents, you know. I had a theatrical agent and didn't do voiceovers. So I overlaid this stuff for him and then he sent it to some people and they said, oh, geez, who's this? And, and I, he was right. He, he knew stuff I didn't know, that he could hear things in my voice that he thought was right. So the first voiceover he got me was, um, Shattered, the thriller in a thriller, full of twists and turns, dangerous curves. And of course the curves was Madeline Stowe taking her clothes off. You know? um, and Bob Hoskins was in that film. Uh, and then I did Searching for Bobby Fisher. Right? And that was a, a very small, smoldering film that was pretty much unheralded. I did 47 voiceover sessions at scale, which is quite a lot of money. And I'm going, oh, I like this, because as an actor, it's the same money. If you're on camera, it's scale. If you do a voiceover, it's scale. The same scale, which I think in those days was 568 bucks a day, plus 10. So I did 47 of them. How much money did I make doing Searching for Bobby Fisher? I don't know why they kept paying me, but they couldn't get it. They, they didn't know what they wanted. Was it a kid's film? Was it a sporting film? Was it an intellectual film? Was it a mums and dads film? They didn't know how to do it, so they had me do it many different ways. If you come in and change one word, they give you all the money again. I love it. <laughs> so, searching for Bobby Fisher, people started saying, who is this guy? And they didn't know who I was. And then my voiceover agent, who was Steve Tisherman, he was the voiceover agent for Don LaFontaine. I don't know how, oh yeah, I do. He was the, one of the guys that heard the reel and said, yeah, I want him. So um, he calls me up one day and he says, uh, I've, we've got a film that's coming out. One of our guys has done the voice on it. It's called uh, um, 1492. And uh, one of my guys doing the voice, he said, you mustn't tell anybody. The producers are not keen on him. So they've listened to our house reel. I like your voice. Did I tell this story yesterday? No. I told somebody this story yesterday. They like your voice. Will you go in and, and, and see if you can do it for them? So I go to a place called Kaleidoscope, which was the boutique voice of a studio for movie trailers in America. Who knew it? You know, I, I didn't know it. This was the most successful place where they made all the big movie trailers. The studios made their own trailers too, but the producers and directors liked having other people giving input. This is my film, we don't, know how to, we don't know how to sell it. Could you sell it for us? Would you make us a trailer? Somebody else goes away and takes their material, they put their own music and their own cut on the piece, and then give it, and they go, oh wow, my movie looks great. So this is what was happening with this one. And I go in and I'm ushered into a room, which is a, a theater with red seats. 
and you could see about eight people in there and a huge screen. I mean, the room was a quarter of the size of this room and great big speakers. And they played me the first movie trailer for 1492, Conquest of Paradise. And it had Vangelis music and it had waterfalls and scenery like you could only find in the Amazon and, and the most breathtaking voiceover of this brilliant guy. And I'm sitting there having an orgasm. <laughs> And, a, and it stops, and he says, you see the problem? And I went, oh yeah. <laughs> and he says, you do? And I said, sure. <laughs> well, would you go show us what the problem is? I said, okay. So I get up, and I walk out into the corridor, and I nearly pass out. I go, Jesus, what have I done? <laughs> well, I, how am I going to do it? Because I, I swear to God, the other guy did a great job. I promise you. Great job. So I go up into the control room and uh, where the microphone is sitting next to the tech. And uh, he says, you want to see it again? And I said, uh, yeah, run it with his voice again. He said, you want to hear, what do you want to hear his voice for? And I said, uh, I, a rhythm thing, that's all, because I want to get the rhythm right, but I'll change it. So, okay, so he plays his voice again. Great job. So then I said, play it without his voice. He played it without his voice. Okay, let's roll it again, roll it again, and I did it. I, you get a kind of a, sometimes when you're doing a voiceover and in a piece, it's like when you dance with somebody you've never danced before, suddenly it's, oh my God, and it's just magic, you know. You're together, you're in sync, it's all happening. It happens sometimes, sometimes when the song comes on. And you've never heard it before, and then you start singing along, and, and, and everything is right. You go, oh, I should be singing this song, you know? I felt like that doing this voiceover. And I finish, and I'm standing up, and I'm looking down into this room, and he turns around, and he points up at me, and he says, start putting a new wing on your house. <laughs> I turned to the technician, I said, I don't have a house. <laughs> he said, well, you're gonna have a house, with a new wing, as many times as you like, because you just cracked the big time in Hollywood. And he was absolutely right. I did 1492, everybody wanted to know who I was. Before that, I tried to break in, I couldn't break in. Uh, and then Steven Spielberg asked me to do the first Jurassic Park. I did that and pff, the phone went crazy. And my theatrical agent saying, I need you to go to this audition. I said, I can't, I've got a voice over it. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. So then I, so eventually, after about four months of non stop work doing voice service, five, six, seven sessions a day. Hmm. Nice, and the scale of money. You know, I was doing, I was doing really well. Uh, just before that, I was thinking of going back to Australia because my career was okay. But you get a guest shot in a Star Trek, you get $6,000 top show in those days. It takes you two weeks to shoot it. It takes you two weeks before that, when you're not, not in work, and two weeks after, till you maybe get another job if you're lucky. That's six weeks, and you get six grand, so that's a grand a week, if you think about it. You, can you keep a wife and a house and the Palisades with two kids on, all the, on, on a grand a week, even back then? And that's if I'm doing five or six guest shots a year. And uh, at best, I was, and so that's 30,000 a year, you can't live on that. So I knew that I had to do something else. I started making 30,000 a week doing voiceovers. And, and that was only the beginning. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not boasting. I'm telling you what, what happened and what can happen in, in America. Uh, and my career after Jurassic Park happened, everybody wanted me. And Don LaFontaine kept on asking for more and more money because he was working to the point that it killed him. Don said to me, when I got Jurassic Park, I saw him walking down the corridor of, the, of, the, of, of our agency and he saw me walking <coughs> towards him and he put out, he said, Nicky, come here. And, oh, and, and he wrapped his arms around me. I said, is it okay? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, they should have asked you. And he said, no, he said, man, he said, I, I don't do much work. He said, it's great that you've got this. You're in the loop. And then he grabbed me tight and he said, Welcome to No Vacations. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I, of course I'm going to take vacations. He said, no, you can't. He said, do you know how many actors out there have got big, long daggers waiting for you just to take one? Level? Never leave. And he never did. 
I went to Spain, I went to Italy, I went to Israel, I went everywhere with my wife, and I upset a lot of people, including, including the man that I'd done for Kaleidoscope. I was on Toy Story, and I went to Italy, a place called Positano, on the side of the Mediterranean mountain there, you know? Uh, and um, he called me at eight o'clock in the morning and asked me to drive into Naples immediately and pick up on Toy Story where I'd left off. I'd organized all this. I organized the studio and everything. But if any of you have been to the Amalfi coastline and where Positano <coughs> is, it's on the side of a cliff. And all the houses are stitched one on top of each other. And when you park your car, you park your car in a hotel where they put your car stacked on top of other cars. And you have to ask four hours in advance, could you please get my car off rack four, please? And so I couldn't get into the studio. I eventually took about two hours to get my car down. I drove around this horrendous road, which is very picturesque if you do it slowly, but terrifying if you try to do it fast to get the Naples to do this voiceover. I got the Naples and I got them to, to call up the studio and, and, and LA. they said, yeah, we just finished that. Bye. I said, what do you mean you just finished it? We had to get another actor, Nick. We can't wait four hours for you. Bye. Boom. I never worked for Kaleidoscope again. Never. And they were like the best voiceover studio. So I shot myself on the foot with voiceovers. Um, and I didn't do Toy Story or anything else after it. And 9-11 was about to happen, and I got a premonition that something was cooking in America. I swear to God, you don't believe me, but it's true. I went, took my whole family back to Australia just before 9-11. How did I know? I don't know. But um, when 9-11 did happen, and my wife went, oh my God, thank God we weren't there, she wouldn't let me come back. I mean, I thought, just go home for a year. It'll be good. It'll all calm down. We stayed there for 13 years. I didn't come back to here till 2013. Anybody that worked with me didn't wait 13 years for Nick Tate to come back, both theatrically and voiceover wise. So it's my own fault. I, I walked away from my theatrical career to do voiceovers. I walked away from my voiceover career and what was left of my theatrical career to go back to Australia and not be here after what happened in 9-11. My wife wouldn't come back, but my son came back. He got married and gave us our first grandchild. And my wife came over to America and she went, oh, we gotta stay. <laughs> and I said, okay, we'll stay. And I came back in 2013 and uh, picked up my career since then, which has gone nowhere. Because people go, Nick, you know the, I think I told this once before, you've probably heard this, the five stages of an actor's life. So for those of you who don't know it, it's got like this. Nick Tate, who's Nick Tate? Never heard of him. That's the first stage. Second stage is, okay, let's see this Nick Tate. Third stage of an actor's life is, get me Nick Tate. <laughs> Fourth stage is, get me a Nick Tate type. <laughs> the fifth stage is, Nick Tate, who's Nick Tate? I never know. <laughs> That's my stage, right? But I just got myself a new manager, I just got myself a new agent, and maybe things will pick up. But you know, if they don't, it doesn't matter. I've had a great life, I've made some good money, I've got some great friends, I have a wonderful family, and I'm okay. As long as I can play golf. <laughs> Tomorrow, aren't we? Joint-wise, yes. 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 Tomorrow, uh, Anton and also Nick will be answering questions as well. So if you're here tomorrow, you definitely will be able to regroup that. Um, just going to take a pause right now because what we're going to do is do autographs. So.